I've had the opportunity to travel to a lot of interesting historical places. There are some places that you go that, for lack of a better way to describe it, just hold the weight of memory. These woods that I'm walking in right now, one of those places. This is a spot where in the latter part of 1944 and the early part of 1945, the U.S. Army just fed one division after another after another into these woods. And the, the combat here just chewed men up and spit them right back out. Some of the soldiers who fought here referred to it as the death factory. Others called it green hell. But most people would better know it as the Hurtgen Forest. So this is the Hurtgen Forest. This is a, a battle that I would venture to say most people don't know as much about as some of the others. Hurtgen Forest has kind of been lost in the shuffle between Operation Market Garden and the Battle of the Bulge. But if you talk to veterans who fought here, uh, many will say that their worst experience was right here in these woods. So we're going to take a little bit of time in, in this episode to, to kind of look around these woods, look at what the, the Hurtgen Forest may have looked like to men of uh, the different infantry divisions that fought here. Uh, but first, it, it would probably do us good to explain why this place. Following the successes in North Africa, Sicily, and Italy, the Western Allies found themselves in a position to launch a cross-channel invasion, which occurred on the French coast of Normandy on June the 6th, 1944. In the days since the Allies had landed in Normandy, German forces had been steadily pushed back until they found themselves positioned behind the defenses of the Siegfried Line, also known as the West Wall. At the center of the Allied drive was the U.S. First Army under General Courtney Hodges. On the 12th of September, elements of the First Army crossed over into Germany just south of the city of Aachen. Once the Allies crossed through the Siegfried Line, they could then move on to the Ruhr River. After that, the last major obstacle between them and the heart of the Third Reich was the Rhine River. Standing in their way was General Field Marshal Walter Model, who was in command of Army Group B. As the U.S. 1st Infantry Division and 3rd Armored Division moved through what was called the Stolberg Corridor to encircle Aachen, concerns arose that the Germans could launch a counterattack into their right flank from the Hurtgen Forest. The Hurtgen Forest was 50 square miles of steep ridges and dense forests. The Germans would put up a stubborn defense of this part of the front for a few reasons. First, the rugged terrain made it ideal for defense by a smaller force. Second, the Hurtgen was flanked to the north and south by the Stolberg and Monschau corridors, which the Allies would have to go through to get to the Ruhr River. For the Germans, the Hurtgen was also important because it formed a defense of the Ruhr River dams, which were important to them for a variety of reasons, but were not really a high priority for the Allies at that time. Most importantly, Keeping the Allies west of the Ruhr River was critical to protect a massive buildup of German troops for a surprise offensive through the Ardennes that was to take place in December. The task of clearing out the Hurtgen Forest fell to the U.S. 9th Infantry Division, nicknamed the Old Reliables. 
The 9th had been among the first troops engaged in combat against the Third Reich when they had landed and fought in North Africa. After fighting through Sicily, they had landed on Utah Beach on D plus 4 and had since then fought in places like Cherbourg, St. Lo, and the Falaise Gap. On September 14th, the 47th Infantry Regiment of the 9th Infantry Division entered into the fray on the right flank of the 3rd Armored Division, with the immediate objectives of taking Schevenhütte, Vechte, and Zweifel. Beyond that, the 9th was to clear out the entire Hurtgen Forest and open up the Monschau Corridor to the south. They would be the first to be thrown into the death factory of the Hurtgen Forest. I've interviewed different veterans who fought here in the Hurtgen Forest, and one of the words that all of them use to describe this place is eerie. Uh, they, they say that, that the woods had just like a, a haunting feel to them, and uh, it, it really kind of added to the, the sinister nature of the combat that, that took place here. The spot where I'm standing right now is known as the Ochsenkopf. And right here, there were three different infantry divisions that fought over this exact same spot. So, so first, the 9th Infantry Division is going to get fed into this place. And then they are going to cycle out in about mid-October of 1944. The 28th Infantry Division is going to be brought in. They are going to get completely chewed up here in these woods. And then, after that, the 78th Infantry Division comes in and fights over this same ground. Now, again, I, I want to manage expectations in this video. In, in this particular episode, we're not really talking about any specific combat actions. Uh, this is more to just kind of serve as an example of what the Hurtgen Forest looked like and some of the defenses that the U.S. infantrymen went up against when they fought here. Uh, again, you have the, the 9th, the 28th, and the 78th all fighting right here in the same spot. So in that way, it's where these guys had a war of movement up to this point, when they get to the Hurtgen Forest, it bogs down almost into like World War I style fighting. The, the lines don't move very much. As a matter of fact, this ends up being the longest battle of the war, and it's all fought right here in this general area. So the, the 9th Infantry Division, like I said, are the first ones moving in here, and they are going to be attacking this Western Wall defense of Germany uh, that U.S. soldiers called the Siegfried Line. From this spot where I am standing right now, we are right on the Siegfried Line. So we're, we're facing west right here. And there was a, a bunker complex that was behind me that we'll take a look at here in just a moment. But in front, well, you can see all of these forward positions. And uh, right here, well, we are standing in one of the German trenches along this part of the West Wall. So if we walk down here, and we can get down, like here's a little foxhole position that we're in. Looks like it took a cut to the left. And then, as you can see, there's a much larger dugout right here. So maybe this is a listening post maybe it's you know designed for a machine gun position but you can see the commanding view that a german infantryman would have had from this point we're up on high ground it's really steep so anybody who is attacking from this direction out here has a big job ahead of them which is why the u.s tried to penetrate the the west wall in strategic points and then circle around and take these bunkers from behind because obviously all of the guns are pointing in this direction they weren't expecting an attack from the back but yeah here's some of the trenches here along the west wall one of the things that men had to really worry about when they were fighting here in the Hurtgen Forest was tree burst uh, a lot of infantrymen had been trained that when you have it, when you have incoming artillery, you need to lay flat, hit the dirt. 
well that could possibly be a little bit of a detriment here in this forest because of tree bursts so the artillery was exploding in the trees and ca literally causing the trees to explode and sending even more shrapnel everywhere so many of the uh the, the casualties here in the Hurtkin Forest were because of these uh, tree bursts from artillery. So uh, the, probably the safest thing to do if you had incoming artillery fire is to find a tree and get tucked up close to it to try and avoid a bunch of this shrapnel that was just flying about. All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, move on to another position here. All right, we've moved out into this clear cut. Uh, this is an area you can see the big windmill in the background. Uh, there's some of these areas of the Hurtkin Forest that have been cleared to make room for these windmills. You might even be able to hear one that's next to me in the background. Uh, and what's a shame is when they were putting these things in, they destroyed a lot of foxholes and trench positions. But moving up here, well, you can see one of these destroyed bunkers of the Siegfried line. And this is just absolutely wild. All right, so uh, let's look around. Okay, so right here, uh, we're looking at like a, a machine gun stand and you can really get an idea for how thick these walls were so let me just jump down in here real quick try not to hurt myself or trip on a piece of rebar or busted up concrete so from the the German position now all of this would have been forested at the time uh, at least I'm assuming so uh, so from the German position this is the view that they would have had and the Americans really had a tough time with these bunkers so what they would have to do is in, in some cases they would you know attack from behind uh, which is what the the 9th infantry division is initially doing with the the 47th and 60th regiments uh, they got behind the Siegfried line and came in from the rear uh, I've read stories where in some cases they brought in bulldozers and buried some of these positions uh, they would have tanks come in and try and shoot through the gun ports, uh, you know, all, all kinds of different things. Uh, they would also have satchel charges that they would bring in and, you know, have a guy run up and throw inside one of these things to try and kill the people inside. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's what happened right here. Uh, there's an account from a German officer uh, who was in this very bunker. And he said that there was an American who ran up with a satchel charge, lit the fuse, and threw it inside. And then at that exact moment, there was an artillery round that hit the top of the bunker, knocked out all the lights. Well, they could see that fuse burning, so they cut it, uh, which, of course, led to it not exploding, and then uh, proceeded to counterattack and ended up taking about 18 American prisoners. But yeah, here's one of the bunker positions right here on the Siegfried Line. One other thing before we leave this position, right here, it may be kind of hard to see on camera, but right through here, well, you can see a trench line that extended uh, just to the side of this bunker and continues on down here and then splits. Again, a lot of this got destroyed when the, the loggers came in and clear cut this, which is really a shame. But uh, another thing that uh, Tobias just pointed out to me is if you look here on this side on on this bunker wall well not only do you see some of the original green paint that was used to camouflage this bunker but there's all kinds of battle damage right here on this side from where again it could be guys from the the 9th infantry division it could be the 28th uh, it's it's hard to say but uh, anyway lots of damage here on this thing
we are moving on to our next position here. And all throughout the, the Hurricane Forest, as I mentioned, you have all these divisions that are getting fed in and then pulled out and replaced by another. And as these divisions came into the Hurricane and then came right back out, well, unfortunately, they left a lot of their dead behind. And some of them are still being discovered to this day. Here in this part of the Hurricane Forest, we have a memorial that is dedicated to a private by the name of Robert K. Howe. Uh, it says he was an American soldier of World War II, 311th Regiment, 78th Infantry Division, U.S. Army. Uh, he rested in an unknown forest grave for 56 years until by chance his remains were found and recovered by a German ordnance sweeping team near this marker. So, so Robert K. Howe um, was killed here in 1944. Uh, the 78th Infantry Division, they were one of the later divisions that got fed into the Hurricane Forest. Uh, but he was killed here and uh, was not recovered until 56 years later. And the spot where he was found is just up the hill from here. As we are walking up this rise, uh, you, you have to uh, understand that, again, this is all clear-cut during the battle this was all forested so at really even up until a couple of years ago uh, it was all forested until they brought the giant windmills in but right here is the spot where robert k Howe's body was found and as you can see it has now become like a, a bit of a memorial people have come here and left stones uh, there's a cross that has been made that has a uh, it's it's concrete but it's fashioned to look like a US helmet but people who come to this part of the Hurricane Forest can come here and uh, remember this infantryman from the 78th Infantry Division Here in this part of the Hurricane Forest is another memorial that is dedicated to some soldiers who for 32 years were listed as missing in action, uh, but were found here on the 12th of May, 1976. And uh, you can see their names there. Uh, there's Francis Dimphel, uh, Richard Quick, both U.S. Army soldiers, and also along with them, an unknown German soldier. So they all died together, or rather died in the same spot uh, in 1944. Here's the location of another bunker position here along the west wall. And, well, actually, that's the bunker position. And here is a piece of the bunker. Now, it looks like it might be a ceiling, but it's not. Oh, let me get down here. This is actually a section of one of the walls. So this bunker was blown up at some point after the war. Matter of fact, right here, you can see uh, one of the, the vents. Um, but, but from right here in this position, well, this would have looked out over the Cal River Valley. So again, we're way up here on a high spot and uh, this bunker would have had a very commanding view of the terrain below. I've moved over to a spot behind the bunkers that we were just looking at and this is what I'm thinking are American foxhole position. So we saw the German trenches earlier in front of the bunkers. Uh, these are, again, behind the bunkers. So Americans needing to protect from a German counterattack would likely dig in right here. So again, the bunker is just over that hill right here. And then on this side of the slope, well, we see all of these uh, remnants of American foxholes that uh, still remain here in the Hurtgen today.
All right, we've moved to another part of the Hurricane Forest, and uh, I don't know if I've mentioned it or not, but with us today is Tobias from the Hurricane Forest Museum, and he knows all about this area and has really been helping us out a lot. But the area that we've moved to now uh, is, is a little bit to the east of where we started out, and this is where the 47th Regiment of the 9th Infantry Division moved through and, and started rolling up some of these bunkers along the Siegfried Line. All right, coming up on another bunker position here. And as you can see, we've moved a little bit closer to the road. Well, there were some specific bunkers along the Siegfried Line that, that were designed to cover roadways and to try and take out you know, tanks and uh, vehicular traffic. And you can't really tell much from this bunker right here because it has been completely blown up. But anyway, this is another one of the, the bunkers here on the Siegfried Line in this area that would have been designed to uh, cover the roadways. Now, something that's kind of interesting, uh, originally these bunkers were designed for the Pac-36, which shot a 37 millimeter round. Uh, but in Russia, they found that that really only kind of tickled the tanks. So they ended up beefing up their anti-tank weapons uh, to something called the Pac-40, which shot a 75 millimeter round. The problem is that the Pac-40 was a little bit too big for these bunkers. So they had to make other arrangements. But here you can see kind of what the inside of this bunker looks like now. So Tobias told us that he was bringing us to his favorite part of the Hurtgen Forest. And man, I can see why. This is cool as heck. Here are a couple of German bunkers on the Siegfried Line that uh, obviously have seen better days. Uh, looks like they were, uh, well, rather blown up uh, at some point. Uh, but again when you see them kind of deconstructed like this you can see just how thick the walls were on these things and oh my gosh man i feel like i'm on some kind of movie set or, or something right now this is absolutely incredible we've moved out in front of the bunker just a little bit and there's another thing that's pretty interesting here. We've got a couple big old holes in the ground. Uh, obviously, these are not foxholes. These are bomb craters from a P-47 that we have knowledge of uh, from the records uh, actually dropped bombs on this position. Uh, now, the P-47 would drop two bombs at a time. So if you look, here's a bomb crater here. And then... We've got another bomb crater right here. So when the Germans were here, one of the American P-47s got pretty darn close to scoring a hit on this particular bunker. Now, again, we're facing the front of the bunkers right here. So, so this direction is to the east, and this is roughly to the west. So after the U.S. took over these positions, well, they started digging foxholes on this end of these bunkers. And if you walk through here, there is all kinds of stuff that has been left behind. Uh, so for example, if you take a look at this right here, well, this is a little section of a U.S. Army issue raincoat. Uh, we've been finding little bits of shrapnel and uh, pieces of uh, ration cans and whatnot. As a matter of fact, here's, here's our pile of just random material that, that we've pulled out of this. So, I mean, you can see here's some kind of sort of charged something. Here's some more of the raincoat materials more pieces from ration cans, all kinds of things that have been left behind here. So here's a, another foxhole here in front of this bunker. Uh, 
this looks like it might be another foxhole there's another one right here now this is a little bit larger as you can see so this is more likely a mortar position so you might have had a 60 millimeter mortar team that was right here in this spot man this is absolutely amazing to be here here's a pretty good example of a a rather well fortified or what would have been a a well fortified foxhole for the american position so you can see it's it's pretty wide so it can hold two to three men you've got an entrance right here and then it's built up there in front well what the americans would do since there was so much artillery that was flying around well they would dig these foxholes and then they would get logs and they would put over the top here to create a little bit of a roof and then you would have uh, a head log there in front and then a little gap where you could uh, you know point your machine gun or your rifle or whatever and here in the back I've, I've read accounts from veterans who said that you'd have to like get down on your hands and knees to crawl in or maybe even belly crawl in uh, to uh, to get into this position but yeah they have a really good example right here in this spot All right, well, there was just a little bit to start off our exploration of the Hurtkin Forest. We have a couple different places that we're going to be going in the next few episodes. We're gonna be looking at the Cow Trail with the 28th Infantry Division. We'll be looking at uh, the high water mark for the 2nd Ranger Battalion that happened over on Hill 400. Uh, lots of things to see and learn. Right here in a place that, uh, that the soldiers nicknamed Green Hell. <laughs>